it's true. I, I spoke with sales, and sales said, Amanda, what do you want me to do with this? Do you think we're direct threat? And I spoke to Derek and Mark both again yeah. at the Highland Peaceful Summit. No, I understand. My, my challenge is, is that I was under the impression First time I did see it was when the email was sent. The email was sent at the end of September. Yeah. But the content and the entire. Morning. No disagreement. It's just that. Right. He, he took a. Um, he took Raj went to Bob. He said, Julianne sent an email saying it was a big deal. And I'm like, no, we didn't see it until last week. She said we collaborated with them. Yeah, but she said we collaborated with them. He gave it to the, even though it's five months late, he gave it to them at the end of September. Bob prepared it with the Okay, yeah. Um, we got switched. Huh? We got switched. We just didn't read the email. It said eight months. Do we need to go, do I need to go register with OIM? Yeah, he's yeah. not there. He's not yeah. there. Yeah, Matt, thanks for being here. Do you want a water bottle? Or is it gonna run out? No, I wouldn't drink the water back there. It is. No, there's bottles. Okay. No, it is. Like no, I went. I need a bottle. Yeah. I don't know. Not this water, brother. Not water. No, my my in-laws live in Black Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> like, their water doesn't taste like this. <laughs> this is like uh, I want the wow. Do you remember that? The guy catch the like yeah. Just my own water. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, the the signage yesterday is 45, yeah. 45, so that's what I was telling you. Well, when, when I went, I went on the website last month. Yeah, me too. And it said 89. Did anybody even show up? I 
No, I brought my laptop. I didn't bring my backpack uh, with like all my handy nifty tools and everything. Handy nifty tools. My flash drives and my yes. charger. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just didn't want to unplug that. Is there a Q&A session and would you like to cut there, give us a question or two that you would like to answer? Or, you know, if you... Nope. I just don't want that dead silence happening when you ask. Yeah. That's why our SEC, I'm sure, have all fantastic questions. Fantastic questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What? Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Matt. Scott, Scott Richardson. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Call about you. Good I think you might have taught a Nextel class for me about really about a like ERT. Uh, yeah, a little bit back, maybe an ERT or something. Or were you in that area? Or am, I, am I wrong? Uh, I yes, created it. Yes, he was. It. <laughs> and I ran it, so. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, we had about a thousand employees who trained throughout the year. And you were in Herndon then, right? I think. Or? Yeah, I had a, a secure facility at Dulles, yeah. in Texas, yep. and then in Florida. Okay. And I had yeah. employees in about. I don't know if you remember Christy Dairy Bear. She got yes, there. I remember Christy Dairy Bear. She got here with AT&T. Yeah. Uh, she, yeah. yeah. How's she doing? Yeah. I used to work with her as a PCM. Uh, she's doing all right. Yeah. She's on that INET, or not INET. Um, FirstNet. Yeah. Trying to sell the public safety. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they got a big contract, I know, in North Carolina for the 911 connection uh -huh. and everything. Yeah. Stuff so, we don't like to sell. I know. Yeah. Anyway.
Oh, <laughs> public safety communications for decades, and they um, they can't agree on anything. I mean, nothing. Yeah, that's kind of what Christy was saying a little bit. Oh my God, she's not sure. So they've got like 26 opting in, but the problem is. And so then the question becomes, how do you make out the rest? Because remember, it's not just paying for it. It's an ongoing operational margin of profit. So their theory is that we'll be seeing it effectively in their house. I'm like, okay, I see how it plays out. I thought Motorola was trying to get some of the big So are they? Oh, okay. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I you know, I had I struggled to remember when Houston went to the American League. Was that realignment like four years ago or something? I I think Milwaukee, think you forgot, yeah, Milwaukee, Milwaukee went to the National League. Yeah. Right. 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 One time. Oh, yes, they were. There's what's his face that, that pitcher, Nolan Ryan, I think, for like 400 miles an hour. Yeah. It was the end of his career that they were going. Because wow. Nolan could, I, I don't think they've ever had anybody throw a ball as fast as Nolan Ryan in the World Series. I mean, he was just super wow. deep. And it's kind of nice, you know, how bad they got wrecked.
I won't talk about uh, FDS and the Is that different from a work organization perspective? We have uh, we have an awful lot of we, we've had we've been a customer of Time Warner since two thousand five or six, um, and that's when a lot of our service was swung over from AT&T to Time Warner Cable. And um, because y'all were not affected by the Restrictions of, mm -hmm. of AT and T, the old uh, incumbent Lex, uh, then um, we just continued to swing service over. Mm -hmm. As of, they just morning. awarded in mm -hmm. September, mm -hmm. and there is no longer an option to purchase directly from AT&T or Comcast. Now you can go to DIT and place an order, handle maintenance, repair, and you know, we're not going to do that. They're just not reliable enough. They're not dependable enough for us to go to the state. So that's why we're going to have to move to that. Well, so, um, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I think we need to refer to the program to the community to take care of hospitality and marketing and program support. So, we have to work with the government of marketing and they have their answers to the new program. And the program is going to be to do extensive amount of work with. Some of our outside counsel. So I was already <laughs> so I, uh, 
or the uh, password is crowd supporter capital P capital S 2017 one word one word thank you no problem but I always like
Yeah, we'll work with you on that. That was pre Y two K. So I, I think it's time that I'm supposed to get rolling. Um, I'm a bit of a walker and talker. I'm not shy. Um, since we only have two of you, I'm gonna make this easy. But you did anyway. My name is Scott Bruno. Rhonda, where are you from? Greensboro. Where's Greensboro? Okay, great. I've got a nephew in Greensboro. Just had a baby, so I'm now like, I guess, a great uncle. Uh, wonderful area. Um, so I am the senior director of vertical marketing and programs. What that means is I'm responsible for government education, healthcare, and hospitality within the company. From a marketing perspective, God, and I've got this camera, so I'm just going to keep walking into it because uh, I'm a walker. Uh, we have marketing on one side, we have programs on the other. One's very operational, one's very uh, front end, back end, but it's collaborative in nature. I'm going to be talking to you today at Nickel Jesus 2017 about increasing citizen engagement. So before I get started, I always think of the word engagement as the ability to interact. There's lots of different definitions. So in order to interact on the citizen engagement, Ms. Kathy's going to be my experiment today. Uh -oh. <laughs> yes. So we're going to talk about how technology can facilitate enhanced technology to increase citizen engagement. So we're going to do a little bit of an experiment. Um, and it's based off two things. And I'll tell you about those in a second. But first, we're going to like, we're going to do a selfie. Then we're going. Then we are going to put this up on LinkedIn, and we're going to post social media. Thank you. Because as we'll talk through the presentation today, it's about how government is adapting technology or lacking thereof at the speed that your citizens have become accustomed to. So just give me one second. I'm going to share. Early morning, where is my LinkedIn? There we go. And I did an experiment, uh, and I was talking to Amanda the other day. There were two, actually. Amanda was talking about my little sister. So I have a little half-sister. She's literally half my age, half my size. So she's 26 years old. She was the first full year in, as an attorney at the Federal Communications Commission. And she was presenting before the commission. And there was a little video snippet. I'm like, you know, big proud brother, because I'm 49, I put up on LinkedIn. She said, it's really cool, Nellie Ann's presenting, here's a screenshot. 10,000 views in like four days. I've got a pretty big LinkedIn network. But that was pretty cool as far as just random social, I mean, that that would be paid for, I don't know what we would pay from, to have that kind of social media yeah. organic presence. The the better one occurred when, when my father um, I had posted um, his, his, his video. He had recently uh, been inducted into the Wireless Hall of Fame after a 42 year. We're, we're, we're a family of commercial communicators into the Wireless Hall of Fame for um, 20 years of the FCC, 22 years in the private sector. And I put up his video. We had an induction video. Now it's up to 16,000 with 125 comments, 900 likes, it's really kind of crazy. And that's just kind of organic, how many different people, all ages, all positions, I had military, civilian uh, colleagues, I had private sector, I had people I didn't even know that were tracking and seeing it. That level of engagement, that digital engagement that's now occurring into society. So we're going to talk today, just real quick, hopefully both of you know, maybe you don't know Spectrum Enterprises, you remember Time Warner Cable Business Class, Spectrum Enterprises, who we are in the mind now. What is citizen engagement? How government are engaging citizen engagement transactional model? This is where we start to get really into the into the heart of it. Uh, and then investing in mobile apps development and solutions. You wouldn't think of, by the way, when we talked here initially, like, hmm, mobile apps development. I don't, I don't think of Spectrum Enterprise in that manner. We're going to talk about the requirement for infrastructure to be able to facilitate that. So today we're going to alter your mind a little bit about just taking a second to multitask to be able to talk about 
how we want to engage, the technologies you require, and why you need to engage. It's, it's really quite interesting. Um, so Spectrum Enterprise, real quick, we're a Fortune Actual 70 company right now. Uh, we have a lot of different services. We combined three companies closing nearly a year and a half ago. Time Warner Cable Business Class, the largest one, Charter Communications, Charter Cable, and then <clears throat> Bright House Networks. What we focus on in the enterprise space is mid-market enterprise and carrier sales. Carriers wholesale. The sweet spot of the business unit is mid-market. That's 25 employees to 499, medium to smaller businesses. Our team in this room and what we're focused on in the enterprise space are strategic. It's government, education, healthcare, uh, that is hospitality. Those are Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000. Big entities that move a lot of data between their either what you would consider your internal or your external customers. And we're there to support all of that infrastructure requirement so that you can focus on what your core mission is. That's what I always talk to is we want to be able to take some of that burden off of the infrastructure needed so that you can deliver against those requirements. So we have our focus is on a dense fiber network nationally. We do do a lot of work on next generation. It's not always some of the sexiest stuff. We do have a sales engineer here, so I don't want to insult him. But some of the technology development we'll talk about, even as we, I was asking Kathy about uh, perspectives on software-defined networking, which is the next wave in virtualization coming out. So it doesn't matter whose infrastructure you're on, what infrastructure you're on, you can manage that bandwidth across an integrated network. We are committed from a quality perspective to making sure we have the right sales, the right support, even when it sometimes goes wrong, that you, you know who you can help to facilitate, whether it's those dreaded contracting issues, some billing challenges. There's depth, so we take a layers and depth approach to our support. You will get to know your frontline team, but there's a huge team behind them and lots of resources. And if you're ever in doubt, um, you can always Skype me, link me, you'll see my contact information, um, and we'll run it down for you. From a government perspective, we have been, and I think we are, particularly at the state and local level, extremely experienced and can stand up and say we're an exceptional leader in government communications and telecommunications support. No doubt. Uh, we are the fourth largest Ethernet provider in the United States. We have 40,000 state and local agencies, and we have tens of thousands of uh, actually hundreds of thousands of fiber route miles, and we have a committed team. It's our largest dedicated team is in the government and education space. So we were just kind of leading into this because I'm just finishing my post with Kathy. Um, Kathy, how do you spell your last name? G A R R I S O N. G A R R I S O N. There's a lot of Miss Kathy Jaffe. K A T H Y? No, you have a T H E. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that ought to nail it down. Are you on LinkedIn? Not anymore. Oh, come on, it's Lauren. Not anymore. <laughs> um, so this is this is interesting on what does engagement, civic engagement mean for government? And there's a really great definition that was done by the Center for Digital Government. Get a special CIO's report. And from an engagement process, it's your constituents, your customers, which are basically all of your citizens. Those are your customers. You have internal customers. Those might be your employees. Your external customers are your citizens. And then you, you have increase in the collective intelligence, but really it's the well-being of the community. What's interesting is why it's important, because the American Center for customer satisfaction, 2014, ran a report. And local government only beat federal government as the lowest of all the private and public sector measurables with a 66% customer satisfaction rating. Federal only beat it by 2%. Eh, that was inclusive of things like the IRS and others. So there's a lot of room for growth. Other sectors, the top sectors were in the 90%. Some of those were manufacturing, some of those were transportation. And there is a real pivot in society today, particularly as entities are transacting either information or, or orders or activities to make sure that you value that customer. 
And so it is a pivot, and, and you are starting to see a lot of cultural change within government to say, how am I approaching my consumers, which are citizens? Technology does make a difference. There was this same report came out with a survey of, of how you can strengthen that relationship. And I think there's some really telling things in here. And can, can innovative technology improve citizen engagement? 97% said yes. No surprise, because most people are actually using technology in their personal lives today. The question then starts to degrade just a little bit. Are you seeing the evidence? So recognition, and then is it being actually in, implemented, starts to drop off some. And that delta is where we want to talk to today about really encouraging not just utilization of technology, but what types and how integrated it is. Because even if you're saying that you could rank the relationship between those as, as high or very high, the actual type of technology you're using, the way the methodology the means, are, and, and we'll talk in the next slide about the different types of it, can improve that quality. Is it a one-way use of technology, meaning there's no feedback loop? So the, the, a real takeaway from here is people are starting to recognize it from a technology perspective. They're seeing that value. But what you really want to do is to see the opportunity to utilize your infrastructure to facilitate that technology to increase that engagement. This slide talks about new ways people are finding it. So this is a survey that will, a series of then and nows that, that takes you through how many people have smartphones. Well, they weren't around prior to arguably 2007 when the iPhone, real first smartphone comes out. I'm not talking about clunky crackberries that we all had. Um, really intuitive devices that can hold applications. So you, you, you have 35% in 2011, only four years later it nearly doubles. The use of social media in 05, well, there wasn't actually many social media applications in 05. Uh, the early adopters were typically um, what I would call late generation X and some older millennials in college. Now you're starting to see everybody using it. My father's very dangerous as a widower on social media. Yeah, very dangerous on Facebook. Um, but he's using it. He can't always figure out how to, how to do the chats or which of the two women he's dating he's accidentally communicating to, but he's using it. It's pervasive. From five to 95 now, people are using it. And then mobile applications. How many people are, have adopted it then in 2013, just a year later? It's a, nearly a six-fold increase. But here's the one thing that I want as a big takeaway. 80% in this, in this poll of government is utilizing technology to interact with the citizens. However, it's primarily in the social media space. Why is that? Well, social media is cheap. Those applications cost you nothing. Um, it's easy, typically, to just set up a graphic image, who's the, who's the moderator of it. It's one way. You broadcast out. Sometimes you will limit even the posting ability back. So you can block that capability. You might use it just to communicate messages on weather, on uh, events coming up, reminding on elections. That's not a very sophisticated way to actually engage with citizens. So where there's an opportunity to integrate greater use of technology on the engagement becomes in the more, a bit more of the complex areas. And, and so as you look at where your citizens are, you kind of talk to them. Uh, baby boomers, well, they're using online shopping four hours per week. Generation Xers, I can tell you my wife on Amazon Prime is well more than six hours a week. Uh, millennials and my child, my children are 9, 11, 13, they're actually Generation Z, there's some millennial now. But my little sister exclusively shops at 26 years old online. But, you know, those are the who's, that, that's your constituency base, that is 18 to 95, right? So those are the adult citizens. Now, there are plenty of children that are out there using devices as well on the adoption side. But really, we're talking, when we talk citizens, we're talking adult citizens that government wish to target and really communicate with effectively and interact. And then they're transacting for, for food. They're getting advice from Yelp. They're riding an Uber like I did this morning with Amanda and Janet. Where are they staying? Where are they shopping? 
And where are you meeting them? And I'm not sure we can say that government is right there on the transactions because there's a lot of citizen engagement and transactions that could be going on, that should be going on, that would increase, I believe, not just the customer satisfaction scores, but actually efficiency within government, that are tracking capabilities, speed to process. There's a lot of things. If, if, you're, if your citizens are here and they have the device and the infrastructure to be able to use them from their end, how do we take advantage of that and plug it in on our end, your end in government? This model is, is interesting. It's from eRepublic's lab, um, which is a technology engagement lab within eRepublic that does a lot of government education assessment. And it's an engagement model. So as we talk about some of those legacy companies like Yelp, uh, TripAdvisor, Amazon Prime, their development, and what's really a, a crazy takeaway, is their, their level of, of effort and their degree of impact this is in-person, automated, internet, mobile, augmented, predictive. Predictive is crazy where you start to see ads popping up in competitive types of consumable goods that you've purchased and somebody is advertising to you because they have these massive algorithmic equation and grinders at Google, Facebook. Amazon Prime, their level of artificial intelligence that they're using, not just augmented, but to be able to predict your quantity, your type, they're even modeling, they're starting to dip into food sales. So if you're looking at, from a food sale perspective, what your main entree is, and they see a pattern of one or two times of what you've bought, they'll try and match the advertisement to the dessert on a predictive modeling basis. Government is right here between automated and internet, meaning you have, to, you have to queue up and ask a lot of questions to be able to understand where your citizens are in a transaction cycle. Where, do they, where are their needs needing to be met? Do they need, does somebody need some assistance based on they've been to the county hospital two times this month for um, a diabetes emergency? And should we be doing maybe hitting them with some predictive training? on how to mitigate that so we can reduce our government health care costs and, and mitigate some issues coming in to those ERs where we can move people off into managed care from there. So there's lots of places you could go to, but where you eventually want to get government on transactions is more down that predictive modeling. So as we talk about the need to get to predictive modeling, plus the current technology we're using. I've had a number of discussions, and in fact, I was in a meeting three years ago with the state CTO in South Carolina. And we were talking about his future cloud planning initiatives from a budgetary and a technology perspective. And his vision was actually pretty forward thinking where he wanted to get to a place that took not only increasing his customer satisfaction and citizen engagement, but I have hundreds of employees that are relatively static in their development. So he was watching an in increase in retirement group, an influx of millennials, and people were getting somewhat capped in their development cycle. And we started talking about the amount of infrastructure and investment he was still maintaining with in his data centers, cell phone data centers, government owned data centers at a statewide level. We were joking about them being served, the, people, the employees were actually farming the servers. They were doing maintenance on the servers. They had some racks that were 10 years old that they were still trying to amortize out. Um, and so where he wanted to go and where we had the discussions from a cloud perspective was how could we offload to infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, that would facilitate his ability, because he started to see, how can I move some of these transactions into a mobile application? And then if I do the mobile applications development, do I want to outsource it to Hyderabad, India, when I have employees here that I'd like to develop? And could we retrain and simultaneously achieve two objectives? Modernizing my, my 
my infrastructure through scalability, moving my budget to a more operational expense model rather than heavy capital expenditure that we're having to depreciate, and creating an environment that is mobile applications development. So literally 100 employees that would be shifted from server farmers to mobile apps developers where they could actually facilitate the development of mobile applications that the vast majority of his constituency base, it's inexpensive. I mean, we have something now like, I want to say we have double on average, I think we're over 600 million devices on network now. Some people have five. Some people have two in the United States. Some people, I guess there are people that are under the age of three and over the age of 95, plus a prison population that's not really allowed to have a mobile device. But everybody's at least got 1.5 devices going in the United States. So he was starting to see that across the economic demographics within his state, rural, urban, suburban, it did not matter uh, whether you were low income, medium income, or high income, you have these devices. And in some instances, people are using these devices in lieu of internet connectivity fixed to the home, or even wireline service to the home, they're outsourcing that. So how can I move my organization, my investment, my personnel into this environment. And the only way he could was to take a look at moving uh, to cloud-based infrastructure and infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. And that provides you a development environment, provides you a test environment, and provides you a really live environment. But most importantly, it allows you to maintain security of your citizen information. It really does facilitate that ability to be creative. You can test in minutes applications. You can now create applications in an hour or two. Test it, run some cycles, make it temporarily live on devices, on a limited amount of devices where people can go in and see, did that transaction really work? Was I clear? Did I get a receipt back when somebody asked for an inquiry for service? Could I give the report back and then launch? And then you have a tremendous amount of scalability and flexibility where you can call 24-7, see, because even as you're working with a cloud partner um, and then having the network connectivity required for it. So the tie-in here is when you're looking to the migration from a data center over into a, a high-capacity, flexible and secure infrastructure as a service, platform as a service environment, you need two things. You need the cloud service provider, and then you need high bandwidth network connectivity via Ethernet. We, we think Ethernet is the appropriate conduit for that because it's very robust. It's not connecting broadly to the internet, so you've got quite a bit of safety and security. Your data is transiting encrypted the entire route, it's your data, you're managing it. So it's really that combination and that strategy of how can I, if I have a goal of increasing citizen engagement, which is a valid goal, and I want to increase the transaction capability or flexibility of transactions, how can I take what I have with limited, I have fixed budgets and fixed personnel and begin to shift and transition over into that space? Do I really want to have server farmers? Or do I want to have a, a new next generation of employees that are developing applications domestically in a very secure environment that make meaningful capabilities for me as an agency to my citizen at all levels, in all different types? You can do your DMV transactions. You can do your citizen well checks. You can, in a secure environment, schedule a time to send a social worker to check on that, that issue. Um, there's a variety of applications that are, that are nearly endless. And, and in, this, in this space, we offer a variety of solutions, no pun intended, across the technology spectrum. Um, but what we focused on in, for today in, in really impacting that citizen engagement through the use of, of network technology is in ethernet connectivity. We have fiber internet access that gets you out to the internet. Uh, this is what creates your virtual private network that allows you to, to do it in a fast uh, environment, a secure environment. And then a variety of applications through our cloud services where it's core, 
hybrid cloud, managed cloud, managed application. But at the end of the day, it still comes up to your citizen engagement, increasing those customer satisfactions within what I would consider the fixed box of capital, infrastructure investments, as well as operating expense investments, and how you can begin to, to migrate into a different environment, moving not just your, your, your spend, but moving your whole organization and, and being much more dynamic and responsive and having as much visibility as, as you can tolerate. I mean, you can log in and, and change and make changes on the fly, whether it's Christmas Eve or July 3rd in a much more dynamic environment, remotely, not just physically. So um, that's what I have to talk about this morning. Since it's a small group, intimate group, two really intelligent customers here. <laughs> do, you, do you have any questions, any comments? Are you yourselves within your organization strategic planning starting to take a look um, at your movement? If you've already started migrating your data hosted in the cloud, what type of data, and are you are you seeing any any internal steps towards mobile applications development to facilitate transactions in your strategic plans? I have a question about yes, that is what the effect of corporate position on the lease of dark power? Um the sorry, I thought it was on my break. Halloween. Um, the corporate position is we will look at dark fiber opportunities on an individual case basis. So we will not say no, but it is not uh, within our core business objectives to be a dark fiber provider. And we have many situations where we have government clients that primarily utilize our lit services, the Ethernet or FIA, and then they're like, well, we need a portion of dark fiber. It takes a bit more on a, on a modeling perspective because we, we, we're just not set up to, to just trench for folks. But we will do it on an individual case basis and we have responded to RFPs with a component. We typically don't do pricing because we, I have literally worked on military bases where they had an undisclosed fuel depot underground that hadn't been seen since World War II. And we had to go around it for almost a mile. And at the federal level, it's cost per foot. And they didn't even know it was still there. So there's always construction implications, which is why it's an individual case basis. Anything else? We won't put you on the spot. I'm, I'm going to take a look at my LinkedIn, even though Ms. Kathy's not here. See how many people actually liked it. It's probably just a man, though. Well, I was trying to find it. I, I <laughs> yeah, I got. I'm hoping by the end of the day it'll be more like Bob Food Time. Get my 10,000 likes. Yeah, it could take more than 20 minutes. It could take more than 20 minutes. But, you, uh, you hashtagged a lot in that post, right? I did. I was trying like to be fast. FCC, yeah, know, so there were that. there were literally um, thousands and thousands of people um, and networks. And I was actually funny. I was taking screenshots of that and sending it to my dad on Facebook, and he didn't understand you know, much of a social media star he had become. And <laughs> I was like, well, you can't really make any money off advertising. It's not like YouTube, right? Where you get 10,000 views, you're going to start seeing checks. Um, so. so, contact information teams here. We're out there all day today. We uh, live, love, and support government at all levels. I've been, I started my career as a federal investigator, uh, and I've worked with probably over 900 agencies at the federal, state, and local level in the past 24 years. So, uh, it's a dynamic environment. It's much more dynamic than people don't understand to work with government. I really enjoy it. So, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for the selfie. <laughs> and I know when I have a moment more to, to task up to put a bit more hashtag. Because I was looking because Nickel Jesus doesn't have a hashtag. They have a mobile app, but it wasn't like Nickel Jesus. Oh,
I didn't see it on online. They posted it in 2017. I was almost going to put fall 2017, so I'll put that on there. Yeah. So I'll hashtag it. And I'll, you know, we'll see if we'll have five likes. So thank you. Good. So can I turn, did that automatically turn off the video? I think they're just going to keep running it because someone presents here at 9. Okay. So you don't need to, they'll, they'll move. Which is her thumb drive? Oh,